It's time to rename the Republican Party. That's what you do when you conquer your enemies. You go scorched earth. You burn everything down. The Republican Party no longer exists. It's MAGA. I'll explain. Welcome to Fearless with Jason Whitlock. I'm Jason Whitlock, your host. Happy Wednesday. Thank you for joining me. Uh, make sure you're hitting that like button. Make sure you're hitting subscriptions. Uh, make sure you're subscribing to The Blaze, to Blaze TV. Uh, awesome show for you today. Uh, today's episode is brought to you by Good Ranchers. Uh, good Ranchers, fall in love with beef, chicken, and seafood all over again by subscribing at GoodRanchers.com. Use my code FEARLESS to get a free $119 Heritage Ham plus $25 off any box with your subscription. TJ Moe uh, joining me in studio today to help me talk about Super Tuesday and what's going on uh, in politics. Big night for Donald Trump, big night for MAGA. On the back end of the show, we'll have some Tennessee Harmony with Anthony and Virgil and TJ. Uh, we'll talk about uh, Pastor John MacArthur. He made some interesting statements this week about Christian nationalism. Comments that I think I disagree with, but we'll talk with Virgil and Anthony about that a little later in the show. But I want to start uh, with last night's election results. Uh, I think it's significant. And I, I think it's time to make the enemies of MAGA pay the price. Donald Trump has overtaken the Republican Party and remade it in his own image. And I think it's time to scrap the Republican brand. It's time to go scorch earth. It's time to run out Mitch McConnell, Lindsey Graham, all the, red, all the rhinos. I know Mitt Romney's already gone. I know what's her, Liz Cheney, she's already gone. But I don't wanna hear from those people anymore because they don't speak for the MAGA party. Donald Trump has completely remade the Republican party, turned it MAGA, it's a good thing. It is the party for the working class. And there have been a lot of Republicans who are not comfortable with the working class. They're no different than Democrats and, uh, and other elites that turn their noses up at people that only have a high school education turn their noses up at factory workers and the common man and, and the people that don't have dreams of being billionaires or millionaires, just want to have a little house, take care of their kids, go bowling, have a beer, uh, go camping, go hunting and fishing. They don't like the little people. And there's been plenty of Republicans that they want to hobnob with celebrities. They want to be globalists. They want to promote climate change and all the other garbage. Republicans in name only. Just kill the brand Republican and rename this whole thing MAGA. Go scorch her. Destroy all your enemies. Remake the Republican Party. The brand is dead. Here's how we know the brand is dead. I want to play you this clip of Karl Rove last night on uh, Fox News. Karl Rove is one of the leaders and one of the architects of the Republican establishment. I want just... This is just a 30, 40 second clip, I believe, of Karl Rove. Listen to how sad he sounds talking about Donald Trump's sweep of Super Tuesday. I think he won every state except for uh, Vermont. Uh, Nikki Haley has announced she's suspending her campaign finally. Uh, she's gone away. But uh, let's play this clip of uh, Karl Rove. And it's basically a eulogy for the uh, Republican Party. You can just hear the sadness in his voice. He's basically crying on air. He's pulling a Ryan Clark or Randy Moss without the tears. Play the clip. The, the high command of Team Trump ought to be concerned about unifying the Republican Party because, as we see in, the, uh, uh, in, in these states, a third of the vote in Virginia, 43% uh, of the vote in Massachusetts going to Nikki Haley, a quarter of the vote in North Carolina, uh, Maine has now dropped down to about a quarter of the vote, but it was 31 percent for Nikki Haley, Vermont 48 percent. There's still some work to be done to unify the Republican Party. You guys remember Tariq Aziz from the Iraqi information minister? 
that you speak for, I think, Saddam Hussein. That's who Karl Rove is for the Republican establishment. Look, they still need to unify. 30% of the people voted for Nikki Haley, blah, 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 blah. We don't need to unify. They need to seek and destroy and go scorch her. Burn, that, burn them all down. Nikki Haley, Lindsey Graham, Mitch McConnell, all, the whole Republican establishment, burn them all down. They don't like the way this uh, Republican Party has been remade into the party of the people, the party of the working class. Many people are, are caught up in that old Republican brand of big corporations and big business. That is now the party of the Democrats. You know how they have this myth that the Democrat Party in the 1960s and the Republican Party, they flipped. And, and the Republicans became racist and the Democrats became the friends of black people. That, that myth that's been sold, yeah, that happened in the 1950s and 60s or, or whatever, it, it did not happen. Democrats got slicker about their racism, that's all that happened. There actually has been a revolution, a real revolution in the Republican Party, and it's been led by Donald Trump. And it's been led by a man who's fighting on all fronts. That's why you gotta tip your hat uh, to Donald Trump. The guy's been fighting on all fronts. They got lawfare going on with him. They got him tied up in courts. They're trying to put him in prison. And the American people, the working class people, are rallying behind this guy. Is he perfect? Heck no. He's not close to perfect. But we had to say, and, and I hate to go here because it will be misconstrued, but I, I got to say it because it's real. And I'm not saying that Donald Trump is some sort of religious figure, but God does work in mysterious ways. And he will send some of the most flawed, unsuspecting people to do a specific job. And, and the working class had no voice in America for really the last 30, 40 years. It's been a long time since the Democrats ever really cared about the working class. A long time. That died 50, 60 years ago. They got in bed very quietly with big business. They've all, they've all, they've become what the Republicans used to represent. And it happened a long time ago. We had this uniparty. And no one was representing the factory workers, the people with high school education, the people that had no interest in going to college. That was my parents. That's what the Democrats used to pretend to represent my parents. And so here's a group of people that had no voice in American politics and some crazy billionaire with some bad habits turns out to be the voice for those people. Mysterious things happen. It, it's, I, I've had the conversation with Tucker Carlson about like, I've asked him specifically, face to face, like, how did you become a voice for the working class? You're, you're from the Swanson family. You're, you're, your dad was in the CIA. You had an interest in being, the CIA, in being in the CIA. And now you've turned into a voice for the working class. How did it happen? Strange things happen. It's very strange thing. People start, I'm talking about Tucker Carlson specifically, I don't know Donald Trump well or at all to know if he's had some sort of uh, awakening as it relates to his religious faith, but I know Tucker Carlson has. And I'm getting, not calling him a perfect Christian. I'm not a perfect, I don't know any perfect Christians, but I know he's had a religious and a spiritual awakening. The scales have come off his eyes. You listen to his conversation, you listen to what he talked about. Th there's something going on. And once you have that spiritual awakening, you start thinking about how to speak for the common man, for the voiceless. Now, you, a lot of Democrats out pretending like that. They'll go, run a, I'm speaking for George Floyd. 
Nancy Pelosi and all Chuck Schirmer, they'll put on kente cloths. I'm speaking for George Floyd. George Floyd wasn't looking for anybody to speak for him. George Floyd wasn't interested in having a job. He wasn't interested in raising his kids. George Floyd was interested in getting high on fentanyl and passing counterfeit money. He was a criminal. He did, we don't need a voice for George Floyd. And I, I'm not writing him off, but he made his decisions. He, yes, he's an image bearer of God. I feel sorry for him and all that. But he didn't need a voice. He, he needed some Narcan and, and some kind of uh, drug recovery 12-step program. The working man needed a voice. The working woman needed a voice. And as Donald Trump, Karl Rove doesn't like it. I'm going to play you uh, one more. No, no, before I do that, I, I want to talk to you guys about... Uh, our great friends at Cozy Earth. You've been hearing me rave about Cozy Earth for a couple of months now and how incredibly soft and luxurious their sheets are. Well, I'm not alone. They literally have thousands of customers who have left five-star reviews on their website, like this one from Hallie. Honestly, the best sheets we have ever had, absolutely a dream to sleep into each night. Everyone deserves to splurge on these sheets. You'll have no regrets. I couldn't agree more. Cozy Earth sheets, available now in 15 awesome colors, are made from viscose from bamboo, making them temperature regulating so you'll sleep cool and comfy year round. Cozy Earth even offers a 100 night sleep trial. Sleep on it, wash it, try it out. If you're not completely in love, just send it back within 100 days for a full refund. Experience life changing luxury with the world's softest sheets. And now save up to 35% on Cozy Earth, loungewear, pajamas, bedding, bath towels, and more. Fall in love with everyday luxury at Cozy Earth. Go to CozyEarth.com and enter my promo code FEARLESS at checkout for up to 35% off. That's CozyEarth.com, promo code FEARLESS. I have these sheets at home. I use them every day. I love them. Comes with my highest recommendation. I want to get back. <clears throat> I told you I'm little bit out of order. I want you to, you don't have to take my word. We're going to play SOT number one. You don't have to take my word uh, for what's going on with the Republican Party. I, I want to play you a clip of two guys, John King and Jake Tapper, on CNN, acknowledging the significance of last night and who, uh, what has happened to the Republican Party and what the MAGA takeover of the Republican Party actually means. Let's play SOT number one. Uh, the map tells you what you need to know. The delegate count tells you what you need to know. The percentage of it has actually jumped up even more. It's 88 percent of the delegates. So you look at the percentage. Uh, Donald Trump cannot mathematically clinch tonight, uh, but he can get within 100 or so uh, of what he needs. And he can do that next week. And so what you have here is, you know, he has remade the party in his image. There are there are still some Republicans who are trying to take it away, like take it back. All right, that's over. That's over. There's no back. That party, that party doesn't exist anymore. Right. It just doesn't. You know, it just doesn't. Look at the House of Representatives. Uh, look at what's happening in the United States Senate. Mitch McConnell stepping aside. Uh, you know, and some of the more governing conservatives trying to keep their power even just within the Senate Republican conference. This is a new Republican Party. Uh, and so you have a very formidable Republican frontrunner who has re remade the party in his image. And I know a lot of people at home are asking, well, wait a minute. We all saw January 6th. Wait a minute. Innocent until proven guilty, but there's all these cases. Um, he has convinced them he won the last election. Never mind anything that happened since then. A majority of these voters are going to the polls in most of these states still saying that you know, Donald Trump should be president. Mm -hmm. And so this is his party. And again, sometimes I think you have know, stop talking. Just look. Uh, this is his this is his party. And he is on a march to the nomination. That does not mean if the election, if the general election were tomorrow, there's a lot of data that suggests he would win right. at this moment in time. It is not tomorrow. It's eight months from now. So you have two very strong front runners who both have very significant weaknesses. And then you have the question of the third party candidates, which I raised earlier. And so the weaknesses come in the sense of uh, uh, in, in very much the way you're talking about how he is reforming the Republican Party. Right more working class, class people, including uh, voters of color, right. African-American, uh, men primarily, but also Latinos, uh, and also the Democrats picking up more educated voters. Right. There's also, so you talked about the education divide, 
Also a big gender divide. Yep. Men voting Republican, women voting Democrat. TJ, I want to bring you into the conversation because th th there could be an argument made that John King and Jake Tapper are sitting on CNN and maybe they're making this, hey, the Republican Party, it's now MAGA, he's totally reformed it. A and they could be saying that thinking it's a scare tactic to their viewers. Yeah, they're trying to demonize the Republican Party. I don't think that's what they're doing. I think they're acknowledging the reality that this whole party has been transformed by Donald Trump. It, 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 it would have to pain a lifelong Democrat, like I'm sure these two guys are, to have to say on national TV, hey, this is the party of the working class. Mm -hmm. I, I think they're coming from an honest place, not trying to fear monger their audience or demonize what Trump has done to the party. Yeah, I think they tried that for three years and have seen it hasn't worked. So they're seeing the same polling that we are. If you, if you go to uh, the exit polling they did on all, all the Super Tuesday states, they said, do you think that Joe Biden legitimately won the presidency in 2020? 66% of uh, the Iowa GOP says no. 51% of New Hampshire says no. 61% of South Carolina. The majority of all these states think that Trump was cheated out of the presidency. So I, I think they know that he was cheated out of the presidency. Yes. Go ahead. And so these guys are see, <laughs> see the same polls that we do, right? It's like that. Well, I think Jake Tapper, especially, he's he's one of. I don't care for him. I, I think he can't see things straight. But I do think he tries to be fair. He's one of the few guys that I think tries to be fair. And so he's looking at this with an acknowledgement of, oh, the the GOP is actually dead. This is really it. And what we've missed because if you I googled it earlier. Go look, put in Trump politically dead, and you will see 10,000 articles come up from 2020, 2021, and they say, we finally got him, dead to rights, January 6th killed him. And it's the biggest political resurrection we've ever seen. And it's not really a resurrection because he was never dead. The elites just didn't see it. The Jake Tappers of the world were celebrating while the rest of us were saying, hey, January 6th was just the people available that day. Everybody would have been there if we were available to go. And the MAGA group never left him. And so they, they did their own specific polling and all that, but I think they get it. I think for the first time, Bill Maher had somebody on last week saying the same thing, that the, the elites are recognizing, oh, we don't actually get the MAGA voters at all. We don't know how to poll them. We don't know how to talk to them. We don't know what's important to them. And they're acknowledging it. The other thing that they said that is fascinating to me is, is or the way it hit me, it's fascinating how the comments hit me. Uh, when they said educated voters are voting for Democrats and the less educated are voting for Trump, I like that. Mm -hmm. I, 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 nobody loves Ball State more than me, but no one has come to the realization that like, and I'll never not love Ball State. I will never not love Ball State. But I don't care about my Ball State degree at all. <laughs> I, I don't wear it as some sort of badge of honor. I don't see myself as an educated person or the way they classify. I don't want to be a part of that group. I, they've been educated into a level of insanity. And so people have heard me say for three years on this show, like, uh, an understanding of the Bible puts 60 points on your IQ. It makes you so much smarter. And, and, and that's where I'm at now mentally. So when I hear people, oh, like Ivy League educated, it makes my skin crawl. I don't, I don't want to be around them. They've probably been educated into a level of insanity and stupidity that I don't respect. And, and so the high school educated person, the, the, it's just like... Uh, Lucas, Botkin, yeah. at T-Rex, at T-Rex. That, that, when I sat down with him and we, we spent the day with him and we're gonna play uh, that video, T-Rex Arms, you guys outfitted me with guns and things like that and we shot a video and we'll play it this week, uh, probably tomorrow. But, but <clears throat> when we sat down and talked with him and, and he walked me through what he had accomplished since high school and, and what he learned and taught himself on his own, started at 18, 19, 20 years old, 
and built this amazing business. Here he is now 30, employing 100 people. He's a provider for 100 people, 100, that get to live out their biblical values and truth. That is that person. And he, he was homeschooled mm -hmm. and then didn't go to college. That type of life experience and that type, and I used to, we used to laugh, I was part of that era that laughed, oh, he was homeschooled, that person's weird and awkward, and I've completely gone the other direction. No, 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 you people that have relied on public education to give you your worldview, you're actually the weird, awkward, insane people, and these guys that were taught at home, and then someone sat down and helped them understand the Bible, they're the actual smart people, and that's who Trump is appealing to. I, I was uh, talking to a contractor late last week, and we hadn't met face to face, but uh, <clears throat> you know, again, I'm going through this home renovation, I'm talking to this contractor, and he said, are you the Jason Whitlock from Fearless? And I, I go, yeah. And, and he goes, oh man, I love your show. And, and, and then, so just making conversation, it's not what I really meant, I was just making conversation. He said something else that I liked and I said, man, are you a Trump voter? And the first thing out of his mouth was, yeah, I am, but Trump ain't gonna save this country. Mm. Uh, only God's gonna save this country. And I was like, oh my God. I gotta meet you. You're hired. <laughs> yeah, literally. And, and, and that's the other thing they don't understand about these Trump voters. They think it's all about worshiping Trump, and it's really not about that. Most of these people feel like he's our only option. He's the only person willing to speak for us. You think Nikki Haley's gonna speak for this contractor I was talking to? You think she's gonna speak for me? You think she's gonna th speak for any of these other factory workers? And, and, and so he's the only guy that's raised his hand and said, you know what, I like these people. And what they don't understand is when they keep telling us, Trump can't get along with anybody. We're saying, good. I don't want him to get along with these people. I see Mitch McConnell buddying up with Nancy Pelosi for years and I hate it. 50 years of Joe Biden, 1973 he started. Do you think he's gonna go against the swamp? I like the guy picking fights. I don't care if we get things done. I want a guy who's willing to go in there and blow things up. And if it's a former billionaire, as flawed as he might be, I'll take him. Yeah, I, I can't believe how anti I've become formal higher education. <laughs> They're indoctrination labs, I, I, you know, part of it, Judge, I'm just being transparent because I want you to have all information. You can judge my opinion. Maybe it's because I can see, you know, I've had a, I graduated Ball State in 1990, so I have a 34 year love affair with Ball State. I've been given plenty of money. I've talked about the school constantly, promoted the school constantly, helped many, many kids, not just football players, many kids at Ball State. The school doesn't like me because of my values. And, I, I've, and so maybe that's part of my worldview and, and position, but you know, my values have made my university hostile towards me, and it, maybe that's blurred my vision on all of these universities. I saw, saw how they treated and abandoned Papa John Snyder, giving millions of dollars to Ball State, one of our most successful alums, and Anyway, I don't think that's it. I don't think that's the reason. I, I think it's clear as day these kids go in with good family values and they come out a Marxist and they try to destroy America and they all become climate activists sitting in the middle of the highway. I, I don't need anybody to not like me to know that's crazy. I, want, I, I got another clip I want to play, but before we do that, uh, guys, you see me sitting here uh, drinking my Cardio Miracle. Uh, I was, had uh, breakfast this morning. Uh, with our CEO at the Blaze, and uh, I don't, I don't know when was the last time you seen Tyler, but not, not that Tyler was ever overweight, but man, this dude is thin. He looks like he's back in his college basketball playing days. He's been on Cardio Miracle as as well and loves it. Obviously, I love it. My family loves it. Uh, friends of mine that I've turned on to are getting great results from it. It's helping me clearly with my inflammation issues. Uh, other Again, I, I shared with you all last week, I got an email from a guy named Mark that talked about, oh my, my doctor couldn't believe it, how my blood pressure's gone down. 
This stuff works. Nitric oxide is a key ingredient in your health. I cannot recommend Cardio Miracle any more passionately. Not only that, John Hewlett and his team, these guys support our values. They believe life begins at conception. They believe in free speech. They believe in patriotism. They believe in our founding documents. You can get healthy while helping people and supporting a business that supports you and your values. Uh, you guys can go to cardiomiracle.com, uh, I believe, slash fearless, or is it promo code fearless? Uh, yeah, cardiomiracle.com slash fearless. Then use my promo code fearless to get 10% off your first order, or you can subscribe and save 15% off with free shipping. That's cardiomiracle.com slash fearless. Stuff tastes great. That's why I drink so much of it, because it actually tastes great. It's, anyway, I want to play this other clip. I want to juxtapose or compare, contrast what Jack, Jake Tapper and John King are saying on CNN, opposed to what was being said on MSNBC throughout much of the night. Uh, Joy Reid, Jen Psaki, <laughs> Rachel Maddow on MSNBC. Uh, a group of women holding a powwow about Super Tuesday. Their conversation sounded a lot different than Jake Tapper and John King, who are not Trump supporters, but at least they're dealing in reality. I'm not saying this is, there are women out there that agree with Jake Tapper and John King, but MSNBC found a way to put a, a gaggle, a, a sorority of of women on TV that uh, said some really silly stuff. Let's take a listen. They're voting on race. They're voting on this idea of an invasion of brown people over the border. The idea that they can't get whatever job they want. A black person got it, therefore drive all the blacks out of the colleges, get rid of DEI. That is what they're voting on. They're yeah. just voting specifically on racial animus which at this stage. It isn't about economics. No, which is why Trump killed the immigration bill. Correct. But that's why. Uh, and because otherwise he can't run against the other and brown people and people who don't look like him. Uh, like his supporters, his base of supporters coming across the, the border and scaring people and killing people or whatever he's threatening out there. I mean, if you look at some of these exit polls, I mean, I live in Virginia. Immigration was the number one issue. <laughs> yes. I mean, again, these could change in, in Virginia. Well, Virginia does have a border with West Virginia. <laughs> very, very contested thinking, area. Build a wall. Like, what? I mean, when I was in New Hampshire, people were talking about the northern border yeah. as a threat. Because Trump has indoctrinated people with this fear of people who do not like look like them yeah. being a threat to them. But as you know, I mean, and every you know every election cycle, when there is particularly when there's a Democratic incumbent, we get reminded about the borders, and the borders become a thing again. And then if there's a Republican in office, we don't think about it. them anymore. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's the it's the deficit and yeah. the border. Like mm -hmm. the, you you make these things an issue, you make them into boogeymen, you make them into something that grabs you from under the bed at night as soon as you wake up. As long as there's a Democratic can come in to blame on it. You, you make sure that nothing's ever done to fix either, yeah. and then you hope that people stop talking about them once you've got a Republican office. Repu These, those three, and then I think Alex Wagner and Nicole Wallace were sitting over there nodding their head or bobbing their head or whatever they were doing, co-signing that insanity, but they're completely removed from reality. Just let's start with Joy Reid. They're just all voting on racial animus. That's all they're doing. But in North Carolina, Mark Robinson, a 355-pound black man, is probably going to be the governor. <laughs> well, what did they vote on there as it relates to Mark Robinson? Was that racism, the Republicans, that he won the primary and has a very good chance to be the governor of North Carolina? But they're just all voting on racial animus. I mean, and I get that their audience is predisposed to believe this stuff. They're voting on values. Many people are voting on values, and they don't care how their values are packaged. Mark Robinson looks like me. And they voted him in to office.
are they're trying to send him to governor of North Carolina. This is a fat black dude who goes to a black church, is married to a black woman, talks like black people, ain't but two genders is what he's known for uh, <laughs> talking about. They're voting on values. You're going to have to deal with that at some point. So Joy Rachel, Rachel Maddow, that's her stupid remark. Jen Psaki, uh, the red priestess, is are laughing. <laughs> what are people in Virginia thinking, caring about illegal immigration? They're not even close to the border. It doesn't affect them. Just because Jen Psaki is retarded and stupid doesn't mean all American voters are. Who, who would make the argument that illegal immigration doesn't affect everybody in the country? Ron DeSantis tweeted out that clip and said an illegal alien was just charged with sexual assault against a 14-year-old in Virginia. It's happening to everybody. Lake and Riley was killed by an illegal immigrant. Mm -hmm. But these guys, they're laughing. And these are women laughing about this stuff at oh, what's Virginia? They, they're not even impacted. I, I, I don't, and then finally, Rachel Maddow, who is, she's one of the most clever liars. She's a clever liar, like Stephen A, she, she's the Stephen A. Smith of MSNBC, except Stephen's not cl a clever liar, he's just a pathological one, and so is Rachel Maddow. Rachel Maddow, but <clears throat> just, just Listen to what she argued. They only care about the border when uh, Democrats or when Republicans, I mean, sorry, when Democrats are in office. And, and, and then no one talks about it when a Republican's in office. When Donald Trump was in office, wasn't the entire left wing media at the border doing reports on kids in cages and look how cruel Donald Trump is? My mother called me crying about that. And I just had to walk her there. Hey, Mama, cut it out now. No, try. Whatever's going on down there was going on down there when any president, you know. But, but again, they, they, they spent all of that time demonizing Trump about what was going on at the border. AOC was down there posing for Instagram photos mm -hmm. and the whole deal at the border when Trump was in office. We've been talk, what's the, there was a kid, there was a Cuban refugee when I was a, a kid, there was a very alien, alien, when I was a kid. We've been talking about the border and immigration for decades. It's always been a media issue. I, I don't understand how Rachel, Mad, Rachel Maddow could say that stuff with a straight face like, oh, this only comes up because Joe Biden's in office, no one would care. if. If millions of illegal immigrants were coming in, if if, if Joe, if a Republican was in, a, I, I I don't know how they live with themselves. <laughs> I just don't. I don't know how they live with themselves. Well, I've seen clips of Bill Clinton talking about the need for a strong border, and I've seen clips of Ronald Reagan talking about it, and I've seen clips of Barack Obama talking about it. So that goes back to 1980. It's. A, Two of those guys were Democrats who were talking about a strong border. And there are charts. I mean, we don't have anything here, but the, the charts of when Trump, starting about 2018, we're under 50,000 border crossings at a time. We're at like 250, over 300,000 per month now with Joe Biden. There's, a, there's been like 8.8 .8 million. And something came out in the last week where Biden partnered with some of the airlines to get something like 320,000 illegal immigrants over here so that it wouldn't look like it was so bad at the border. They actually flew them in. I mean, this is where we have to, so to have that, a group of women who have no problem lying to our face and then laughing and saying, oh, the real problem is they're actually bordered with West Virginia, those Republicans, they're the real problem. I can see why they'd be upset about that. They're crazy. And so, I mean, look, more power to you. I hope they keep talking like that because they're like, you have those conversations with, without the brainwashed people, any of the independents listening to that are like, these, these people are nuts. It's minimally one lesbian, two, three, I don't know how many on that board. And they're sitting here laughing at us and our problems and telling us, yeah, that 14 year old girl who got sexually assaulted, <laughs> don't worry about her. 
Crazy. Uh, we're going to switch up here in a second and bring in Anthony and Virgil and, and continue the political conversation from a different point of view. John MacArthur, Pastor John MacArthur, said some interesting things about uh, Christian nationalism. And, and, and Michael Moore, the documentarian, he, he said some things about Christians being white Christians are the enemies of Jewish people. I want to ask Virgil and Anthony about that as well. Before I do, I want to talk to you guys about uh, our good friends, the Robertson family. You've been asking to see more Phil Robertson and his family. We listen. Cooking with Phil, Miss Kay, and the family has always been one of our favorite parts of the shows, and that's why we brought you more of it. It's time to go from Dynasty to Dining with the new hit show, Cooking with the Robertsons, available exclusively to Blaze TV subscribers. This show features Phil, Jace, Al, and others showing off their favorite recipes, cooking up a mess of delicious food, and dipping into godly wisdom in the way only the Robertsons can. It turns out family recipes and family values really do pair well together. So grab yourself a plate and pull up a chair. Just don't forget to say grace before you dig in. This show is only available if you have a subscription to Blaze TV. So if you don't have one yet, head over to blazetv.com and use the code Robertson30 to get $30 off your first year. But hurry, because this code won't last long. That's blazetv.com code Robertson30 to get your $30 off subscription and start streaming Cooking with the Robertsons. I wanna add this to that Cooking with the Robertsons. If you want to support this show, the most important thing you can do is get a Blaze TV subscription. I'm talking about it is number one. The number one thing you can do is get your Blaze TV subscription. Go to blazetv.com slash fearless. Use my promo code fearless and you can save $30 on your yearly subscription. Blazetv.com slash fearless. It's, if you're part of the fearless army, if you're watching this show, every day and you believe in what we're doing, the number one thing you can do to support this show, blazetv.com slash fearless, use the promo code fearless, save $30 on your yearly subscription. All right, uh, Tennessee Harmony, next. Hello, Fearless Army. I'm Jason Whitlock, your leader. I'm going to spend 2024 discussing growth and sacrifice. Hard times are here. Harder times are coming. What has stopped American growth and caused a regression in fundamental freedoms and values? A lack of sacrifice. Our ancestors sacrificed for our benefit. We have not sacrificed to protect the progress they died for. No sacrifice no freedom. What impedes man's willingness to sacrifice? His ignorance, his perversion, his pride, his ingratitude, and his cowardice, his rejection of God. The Bible is a story about the power and the necessity of sacrifice. Sacrifice is the sun, rain, and fertilizer of growth. Growth is our life purpose. Grow in the knowledge, wisdom, fear, obedience, and reverence to the most high. Growth requires sacrifice will be our theme for Roll Call 2.0 this summer, June 1, right back here in Nashville. We're excited to welcome you. Let me spend a minute explaining what G-R-O-W-T-H actually stands for, for us in the Fearless Army. The G is for game plan. In order to properly grow, it's essential we work from the strategic game plan spelled out in the Bible. The R, responsibility. As we grow as men, we understand and accept our responsibilities to God, family, and teammates. The O, ownership. We embrace ownership of our destiny. Outsiders do not determine our fate. The W, wisdom. We honor, value, and share the wisdom imparted to us by elders, coaches, and leaders. The T, trust. We must be worthy of trust. The reliability of a man's word defines him 
far more than popularity and material possession. The H, humility. The reward for humility and fear of the Lord is riches and honor and life. That's straight from Proverbs 22 and four. Come join us in Nashville as we talk about growth and sacrifice and how without sacrifice, there will be no growth. Roll Call 2.0 right here in Nashville, Saturday, June 1st. And I know he has that picture where he has the French fries going down his legs. What a weirdo. He has the picture where he's dressed like Puffy. And then there's a video where Puffy is calling him daddy. Man, you doing it, man. You deserve it, daddy. You putting in that work. I'm proud of you. I love you. They also revealed that he follows this gay porn Twitter page. Look, you know. I ain't saying he is. All I can tell you, sir, is that he's gay. But I'm saying if it walk like a duck, quacks like a duck, and... Fall off! <laughs> it's Daffy. I mean, it's just too much. <laughs> just, just go ahead and call him Daffy. <laughs> You're despicable. All right, time for some Tennessee Harmony. Anthony and Virgil here with us as always. T.J. Moe still with us as well. These are, generally speaking, uh, the best Tennessee Harmonies when we got T.J. in studio with us, and there's four of us. Uh, Anthony, uh, get us started with a prayer. Father God, we thank you for today. We thank you for your blessings. Father, I pray uh, for men around the country to continue to stand up and be the men you've called us to be, uh, good men, good fathers, good husbands, and good mentors to others. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, so uh, Virgil's, I don't know if one of his top pastors, perhaps his favorite pastor. And I, I say that, you know, with no, I'm not joking, Virgil. I, I got a lot of respect for John MacArthur, and I know you do as well. Uh, mm -hmm. He made some interesting comments, I thought, in the past 24, 48 72 hours. At some point, I saw this on Terry Green's uh, Twitter feed. I, I get a lot of her stuff where uh, John MacArthur had some interesting things to say about Christian nationalism, things that I, I don't know how I really feel about them. And so I wanted to bring it up here in conversation. Uh, and particularly, there was big political events last night, so I thought it flowed perfectly. So this is like a three and a half minute clip of John MacArthur. I think he was doing a Q&A session with his congregation and they asked him about Christian nationalism. So this, this is a long clip, but let's play it and that will begin our conversation. I'll give you a simple answer. There's no such thing. There is no such thing as Christian nationalism. Um, the kingdom of God is not of this world. Jesus said that. He said, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight. His kingdom is not of this world. The kingdom of this world is a separate world. They're not linked together. Let me say it another way. <clears throat> Nothing that happens in any nation, whether it's a um, communist nation, a Muslim nation, or a quote-unquote quasi-Christian nation or an atheistic nation, nothing in that nation politically, socially has anything to do with the advancement of the kingdom of God because the kingdom of God is separate from that system. God in His sovereignty is building His church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it, Jesus said. So the idea that you should link up some political effort, some political process, some social process, some gain of power or influence in a culture as part of the advance of Christianity is alien to Christianity. You never have our Lord 
approaching anything like that, nor the apostles, and particularly the apostle Paul. He sought to gain no favor with the Roman Empire whatsoever, or for that matter, with any other of the rulers that he ran into during his life. Now, that is not to say that we are indifferent to what happens in the nation. We've been talking about that the last couple of Sunday mornings. We, we, have, to, we have to be the people who uphold righteousness. We, when we come to vote, we want to vote for that which is the m- most righteous option. Uh, obviously, we can't vote in righteousness, but we, we have to vote in a way that reflects our commitment to the righteousness of, of God. So we couldn't possibly elect somebody who was an abortionist, somebody who was LGBTQ or LGBTQ affirming, or, or any other deviation from uh, God's righteous moral standard. So it gets harder, doesn't it, nowadays? Because even sometimes when politicians are more conservative and anti-abortion, they may be, um, they may be sinful and wicked in some other categories, and um, it's very hard to find out who is really honest and who is simply dishonest and seeking power. So. That's John MacArthur, and Virgil, I'm going to have you go first because I think you know him best. And so there's there's part of that I, I agree with, Virgil, but there's part that sounds kind of defeatist to me, and, and I don't know if I disagree, but I, I'm just uncomfortable. And, and it's my belief is that, like, the purpose of this show is trying to with me, I'm just a part of the audience, just like everybody else, but I'm trying to have conversations that help me uh, understand my values and commit to values that are consistent with the Bible, stand on those values, and, and change my heart and soul and mindset while changing the heart and mindset of the audience. And if we do that, it will have a political impact because I think we are getting the politics on both sides, all levels. We're getting the politics and the politicians and the policies that reflect our broken souls, our, bro- our, our, our lack of commitment uh, to a biblical worldview and biblical principles. And, and so, mm-hmm. But I hear part of what John MacArthur is like, hey, there's nothing you can do. And yeah, vote your values, but you know, nothing you do here really matters. That's kind of how it comes across to me. And it's a bit of a turnoff, but Virgil, clean up or, not I'll clean up is the wrong word. Uh, explore, tell me what you yeah. think John MacArthur is trying to communicate here. Yeah, I, I, think, I think for the most part, MacArthur is not saying anything new that I haven't heard him say. And I think, I think it's okay to, for some to hear what he says and say, you know what, I, I don't, I don't agree with that. Uh, I've never been one, you know, this well about me, Jason, never been one to, to buy off or sign off on everything everybody says just because they have a name or they're uh, a popular uh, at the same time. I, I think in fairness to MacArthur, I think he was trying to make a distinction uh, related to Christian nationalism in that if the idea behind making a nation, a quote unquote Christian nation, uh, somehow it allows the nation to, to help others enter the kingdom of God, uh, or that by electing the right official, uh, others will come to Christ. I think he's wanting to, to abuse people of that notion. Uh, he's wanting to separate the idea that that we that that salvation can come through politics, or that salvation can come through policy. Uh, he's wanting to make sure that you know that salvation only comes through the church by the preaching of the gospel, and that's it. So there's the division. The dividing line is that the church proclaims the gospel. Uh, that gospel is impacted on the lives of of men. Uh, Their hearts are transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. And as a result, uh, they come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ through repentance and faith. 
He wants to separate that from any notion that we can elect the right officials, put the right policies in the office, have the right social structure in place, and thereby somehow have a quote unquote Christian nation uh, where salvation is now something accessible to all. Um, the last last point I'll say about this: I do think uh, that that uh, that there are policies that can be enacted, that there are politicians that you can put in place that make proclaiming the gospel easier to do, easier to accomplish. Um, there are politicians that can be elected that make pr- promoting the gospel more difficult to do. Uh, absolutely. And I think John MacArthur would advocate those who would make it easier for us to get our message out. At the same time, he's not, he's not a, he, his thing is, even if the governor uh, or government opposes the church, um, it will not stop uh, God from advancing his kingdom. And keep in mind, it was MacArthur who pushed back on Gavin Newsom uh, when, when the uh, uh, state government wanted to shut down uh, John MacArthur's church. He said, no, we're going to uh, obey what scripture has to say that Christ is the head of the church. Government is not. And so we're going to remain open. He fought that battle and won. So far, he's far from in, in his actions. He's far from being defeatist. Uh, last thing I'll say about, about Newsom, when the Dobbs decision uh, happened uh, and Gavin Newsom stood up and said that California would be a state that would welcome abortion, uh, you know, abortion and, and, and invited people to come. It was John MacArthur who wrote a letter uh, excoriating uh, Gavin Newsom and really challenging him to uh, to repent of that stance. And so he's not opposed to making a stand to taking a stand. He's demonstrated his willingness to do so. I think he's just simply wanting to separate the idea that 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 voting for the right politician is somehow salvific when it is not. So, Anthony, let me throw it in your court with this question, and I'm piggybacking off of Virgil's point. Is that a point that most Christians need explained? Because I don't think, my, my belief is, I think most people already, that's not how you enter the kingdom of God. You, you don't, salvation isn't through politics. I think most Christians believe that. And so at, at your church, I, I think it's so easily, through mm-hmm. faith, mm-hmm. It's, it's all explained. Except mm-hmm. Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. I don't, and so John MacArthur's saying this and making this point, well, you don't enter through politics. And, and I don't think it's a necessary point. And then I think it can be confused as, uh, eh, there's really nothing you can do, just lay back and enjoy it. <laughs> and so my whole thing of wanting to promote a Christian worldview is because I think if we had more of a Christian worldview, there would be less abortion, there wouldn't be any uh, drag queens reading to kids. And, and so I, just, I literally, and I'm not exaggerating, I'm not lying, to me, everything that I'm, that I'm trying to promote is about how can we make things easier for kids? Because I see the other side making things more, di- you can't even get out of the womb with, with them. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. Then, yeah. And, and then once you're out of the womb, they want to have discussions with you. I just saw a video. I wish I'd told these guys to call. I just saw a video, a bunch of Kansas City politicians reading a book to kids about transgenderism. Yeah, I saw that. I saw and, that. And so I just want to stop that. Sure. And it, I don't think I'm going to enter the, if I do it, I don't think it's going to put me in the kingdom of God. And I don't think it's going to make mm-hmm. it easier for other people to enter the kingdom of God. I do think it'll make it better for kids. Per the general definition of Christian nationalism, though, you're not pushing Christian nationalism. You're right. just pushing Christ. Like you, you're just right. wanting Christ to be lifted up. And I think that's where John MacArthur is di- differentiating it. Christian nationalism is a political movement at this point. It's, it's a political, especially when you tie in nationalism. I hate to cut you off. Go ahead. But, but I, I have to. Go ahead. I'm 56. Okay. It wasn't until three or four years ago that I ever heard of Christian nationalism. Sure, sure. I think it's an invented term by the left or by Satanists. Let's take politics out of it. Just like, (laughs) let's make them talk about this. 
Mm -hmm. and, and right on command, we start doing sermons and talking about Christian nationalism when all Christians want to do is like, nah, man, if we, if we could get this Bible back in school and if we can get some more Christian worldview, our kids will be safer and it'll be my values that I teach in the home will have a chance to survive outside of the mm -hmm. home. Mm -hmm. I think that's all anybody, but, but they've tricked us and hey, let's have this conversation about Christian nationalism. And I'd live 54 years without ever hearing the word. If you were in, think of it this way, if you were in a conservative audience and you said, I'm not a Christian nationalist, what do you think would happen? What, how, how do you think the discussion would go if you say, hey guys, I'm not a Christian nationalist. Ten years ago, everybody would have said, "What's that?" Got gotcha. you. Yeah, but, and, but I'm saying today. I, I'm with. I know how how terms can you know come about. I'm just saying, as the term has come up, what does that mean now? I I wouldn't care what people thought of me sure. saying that. But what would? I, and, and I know I know that. But I'm I'm speaking of like, what would they think? And, and not that you value their thought as far, I'm saying, but what, what would that say about Jason Whitlock in that moment? Like, is, are you really a believer if you're not a Christian nationalist? Are you a believer if you are? Like, what would that, if you say, hey guys, I'm not a Christian nationalist. I don't, it's hard for me to go there because okay. I, I, I think I am a Christian nationalist the same way okay. the founders were okay. in terms of they said, you know what, we're going to come up with a system of government consistent with this Bible. Okay. I'm for that. Okay. I'm 1,000% for that. Gotcha. So based on this made-up definition that Democrats just came up with and, or whoever just came up with, I fit the description of a Christian nationalist. Mm -hmm. All I want is a government and a culture and a society that's... Uh, somewhat supportive, just not anti-Christianity, because mm. I think it makes it life easier for parents and for kids. And so I felt like I grew up as a kid in a mostly Christian environment, and that mm. helped my development. Mm -hmm. And I think they're taking that away from kids. And, and so now, I'm again, yeah, we don't even know what truth is. And that's really at the essence of oh, the yeah. Bible. This is just a book of truth. Sure. And, and they're eliminating it and making people get on the defense. Oh, well, you're a Christian nationalist. No. It's the, it's the, ter it's the term. So I would, I would in responding, I, I, would, I would say this. Um, what I heard from John is what would be consistent with how I would handle the question. I would just take you back to the book. So there isn't mm -hmm. a biblical mandate to be a nationalist as it relates to your country. We do have Jesus giving us instructions on how to be a citizen. Paul gives us instructions on being a citizen. But all Christians, every, every Christian we find in scripture, their allegiance is to the kingdom of God. This is why, you know, John MacArthur says, as Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. So it's not based off of any particular nation, but God is, his kingdom is for the whole world. So what happens when you deal with a national discussion, when you have that term nationalist, usually from a nationalist perspective, it is, hey, I want my country, I could care less about the rest of the countries, I want my country to be X, Y, Z. How that differentiates from a biblical dynamic, though, is that God is trying to save all mankind. He tells us, uh, Paul tells us in uh, 1 Timothy, God wills that all men be saved. So you being a citizen who says, hey, I want a Christian environment, given the abstract term Christian nationalist, that doesn't make you that. That just makes you a Christian who wants a good Christian environment. The political angle is what's tangling it now because now Christian nationalism is if you don't agree with, hey, we should have this, there oftentimes is critique on your faith. So we, we try to just stick back to the word to say, okay, does God tell us that we have to be a Christian nationalist? No. Does God give us a mandate that, hey, we have to do this in this particular nation? No. Our, our design by God, hey, be the right, a godly man, godly husband, raise up godly kids, disciple the entire world for Jesus. And that goes beyond 
the borders of our nation. And so I would argue like the founders, no matter how flawed, mm -hmm. they were like, hey, we're gonna devise a system that makes it easier for Christians to promote their value. Sure. And, and, and I think that the very clever people that want to uproot the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence and say, you know how we can divide Christians? Let's throw in this word nationalist. And now Christians, they can bicker over who's a nationalist, who's not. Should you be a nationalist? Who shouldn't you be? And, and again, it, Christian nationalist doesn't come from this Bible. It doesn't come from God. It's something someone else made, made up. And now we're arguing and fussing over it. And, and I'm just someone as wise as John MacArthur, I would think, would just be like, Man, I ain't even going there. That, that's some stuff they made up. <laughs> and and it, for those of you uh, that uh, want some Bibles back in school, I agree with you. That's how I would handle it. And for those of you that want to, to drag queens out of schools, hey, I'm for that for, on biblical reasons. I think we, we've got a fundamental disagreement on what Christian nationalism means. Because I, I know I disagree with what you, your definition that you just gave. Okay. I know I disagree with what Virgil has said in the past and how he's unpacked it. Because if, if, it, if I believed what it were, uh, what Virgil believes it to be, I'd probably disagree with it too. I don't think that's a definition. The definition, as I can find it, is it's primarily focused on the internal politics of society, such as legislating civil and criminal laws that reflect their view of Christianity and the role uh, that religion plays in political and social life. For me, that means vote your values. Put that in simple terms, do you vote your values as a Christian? And what John MacArthur did he, when he came on the show, you asked him about Christian nationalism, and he said, well, nations can't be saved, only people can. Well, of course I agree with that. That's not what Christian nationalism is to me. And so Christian nationalism is I get a vote, I'm a citizen, I don't get to vote in Uruguay or Italy or anywhere else, I only get a vote here, and I want my laws here to reflect my values. And I will die on this hill. They have taken separation of church and state out of whole cloth, created it out of nothing, and said, okay, we're going to build on the back of that. Now that everybody has been conditioned to believe that separation of church and state is a good thing, even though it doesn't exist, now we can say Christian nationalism is bad. And you Christians over there, you don't get your vote your values. Only me, a secular atheist, I get to vote my values. The rest of you people, shut up and vote against your values. And so as all of that relates back to Christian nationalism, of course I'm a Christian nationalist. I get to vote my values just like you atheist idiots. The other th where I agree, and Virgil, I'm gonna throw it back to you, I know you're chomping at the bit, uh, is just to put meat on the bones of what TJ said, he put a lot of meat on there, I'm gonna add an extra layer. So I want a country, and we used to live in a country, where you went into criminal and civil court, and in that building would be the Ten Commandments. Because our, our laws, we know that murder is wrong because the Bible told us it's wrong. Right. We know that coveting is wrong. And, and, and so they used to put the Ten and now they're taking him down in court mm -hmm. because, oh, that's Christian nationalism. Mm. And, and, and I'm just like, nah, man, that's setting up a system based on biblical truth. And, and we want our systems, our criminal justice system. That's why they still at most hotels have a Bible in the hotel. That's a reflection of our values and, and what, what we you know, used to unite us. But Virgil, uh, I, I'm just, I reject the term Christian nationalist. I think it's a weapon to divide us as Christians. Yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't disagree with that. And again, um, to the point that, that TJ made, I think that there's a there's a lot of different versions of this that that are out there. You have the Michael Flynn Christian nationalists that are. I mean, that's that's really the largest group of of folks who who are under the banner Christian nationalism. A lot of those folks are just um, you know mainly you know non denominational charismatics uh, who are patriots. And so you know I, I think for the most part they're wanting to vote their values. You have within that group you have some folks that are that are a little bit zealous. Uh, where you'll see them with pictures of, 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 you know, an image of Jesus standing over Donald Trump, right? And he's and and the Jesus figures laying his hands on Donald Trump. Uh, so, so you have some of that you know, kind of extremism with with regard to the what you see. Uh, that you have uh, more serious Christian nationalists who are who are saying, okay, I I want all of what you said, Jason, and 
I want, and what they would say is they want the first table of God's law enacted. And basically what they're saying is the Ten Commandments. They want the Ten Commandments, all of them, not just the ones you mentioned about coveting or about murder or about lying. Uh, they, they want those, you know, they definitely want those codified in law, which they are. But in addition to that, they would say, you know, uh, the, the first commandment, have no other gods before me. They would say, you know what, there needs to be no worship of any other God other than the God of the Bible in the public square. Uh, where, where it, it, you know, uh, the Ten Commandments says you, you, you should have no graven images. You, you should have no graven images. Statues of any other image uh, would, be, would be torn down if it did not honor, honor God, taking the Lord's name in vain. There would be blasphemy laws. You, there would be certain things you couldn't, couldn't say on the basis of the fact that it dishonored God. Uh, the Sabbath, keeping it holy. There are some who hold the Christian nationalism that say uh, church attendance should be mandatory and mandated by law. And so the, you, when, when, you, when you go down this road of adopting these new terminologies that, are, that you just heard about three years ago, uh, and inculcating them into your vernacular to say, this is who and what I am, I, I think you've got to be careful. You've got to pump the brakes and think about these things honestly and thoughtfully before you just simply say, I, I wrote down what TJ said, hey, it, it, Christian nationalism just means I vote my values. Oh, okay, I, I agree with that, but I've been doing that for as long as I can remember, long before the term Christian nationalist came around. Last thing I'll say, Jason, is you mentioned this earlier. You said... Um, you know, I, I, I can see uh, being called a, a, a Christian nationalist if it just means, you know, voting, voting my ideas and not having drag queen story hour, not having, uh, you know, uh, mutilation of kids. I can I can stand against those things and not be called a Christian nationalist. And, 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 the, and the, the other thing that, that I'll mention is. Oh, is no, this. Virgil, hold, hold for one second. Hold for one second. <laughs> let me let me let me give you a real life example. Let me, okay. You think you can, but but there is nothing about me at this point at 56. Now, previously, the, the, maybe you could, but nothing about me that anybody should open their mouth and call me the N word. I can't control what people call me. Sure. People call me the N word all the time. Yeah. Mostly black yes. people. Right. Uh, call me the N word all the time. They call me all kinds of things, Uncle Tom, Sella. I can't control any of that. And so that controlling what people call you or identify, eh, that's outside my control. People are crazy. The other point I want to make to you, Virgil, is and to the group, not just to you, Virgil, but to the group, is, is and I want us to explore this. This isn't, I, I don't know how strongly I feel about it, but when there's, take the, assault on masculinity. And masculinity, do we agree it's under attack? Mm -hmm. We agree. Mm -hmm. And so there's less masculinity in American culture than there used to be. And so there have been people that have made the argument, that's why there's these ex super extreme examples of masculinity. That's what made Donald Trump popular. Mm -hmm. is you take away masculinity and people start looking desperately for masculinity in any form. And, they, and the reason I know this is because that people have written very thoughtful pieces like rap music and the hyper-masculinity in rap music and Donald Trump, th their rise is connected to the elimination of masculinity. People are so desperate, they'll take ass uh, masculinity from anywhere. And so as we eliminate Christian values and there's all this hostility towards Christianity, I'm not surprised that some people are looking for Christianity anywhere and they become very extreme in their Christianity. And so it's been the elimination of the values and the popularity of secularism that has made a lot of people look crazy. Just like I look crazy when I would have that rap music blaring out of my car, windows down, with all that cussing and talk killing and bees and hoes. I looked insane to any normal person. You eliminate masculinity, you start looking for it in the wrong place. You eliminate Christianity, people start hunting for it in wrong places. And so I'm saying, let's give the people some Christianity back okay. and watch the insanity go away. 
What is the difference, before I get into, what is the difference between a person who is obeying scripture and who is being the citizen that we find in scripture and that citizen would vote their values? What is the difference from that Christian and a Christian nationalist? You're asking someone who doesn't believe in Christian nationalism. Okay, but even, well, you, you do, you do, in some ways embrace like if this is what that is then you'll take the term so i'm saying if if this works i'm looking at it from a word dynamic i study word when we were studying scripture like we just go off of the word i'm saying rather than to have a new terminology to counteract the cultural dynamics let's just be what the book tells us to be and we don't have to worry about any of those i wouldn't for example use the the term about masculinity there is masculinity by definition. The world has done its best to try to take that out. There's also a thing called toxic masculinity. Not all toxic masculinity is bad based on the world's definition of it. But I would not go around to say, hey, I'm a toxic masculine guy, if that's what it is. I would just say, no, this is what masculinity really is by the book. So I'm saying from a Christian standpoint, I don't know why it, it seems redundant to me if by obeying scripture, I would be one to vote my values. Why would I have to lean towards or even accept the term Christian nationalist if what a real Christian is, is actually what has already been defined biblically? So I, I feel like I'm going to repeating myself, but okay. I'm going to do it again. Help, help it for slow guys like me. No, no, it's not. It's, <laughs> it, it's, it, my approach is someone hollers the N-word at me sure. in a term of infection. Mm -hmm. I don't respond. Okay. They can't be talking to me. My name is Jason. Right. And, you know, so, hey, image bearer of Christ. I might, I hope they're talking about me. <laughs> sure. And, sure. And so I just don't respond. Sure. That's the same way the Christian nationalist thing, I just... This is crazy. What are you talking yeah. about? I'm just a Christian. Yeah. And so I, I just, that's where I, I would, John MacArthur is very famous for saying he's dead to the world. Be dead to the world then. Right. If the world makes up the word Christian national, well, I'm dead to that. I'm just a Christian. I right. All I'm saying here is don't run from it because they're going to call you it no matter what. Yeah, that's sure. my real point. So everybody's, don't embrace Christian nationalism. I'm exactly who I've been all the time. What I'm saying is don't run from it and don't let them talk you out of voting your values because you happen to be a Christian. That's what the, that's what the whole intent of Christian nationalism is. So they've created something to get us to run from our values and don't take the bait. Yeah, that's my argument. Virgil? Yeah, I, I, I would say this um, ab about, the, about the issue of the label. Jason, you mentioned the N-word. There's a difference between someone who doesn't like you or is not for you calling you the N-word, you hearing it, and you ignoring it. That's, that's one aspect. It's another thing for you to say, the N-word is who I am. That's who I am. That's, who I, that's what I'm about. Um, that's what Christian, those who are advocating a Christian nationalist position are saying, okay, you're going to call me that? Cool. That's what I am, and that's what I'll be. And now they're defining the term. They're, they're taking the N-word and making it favorable. They're taking the Christian nationalist word and, and, and are attempting to make it favorable. In, in, in 2018... The same mistake young black people have done with the N word. It's a mistake. I, I, and that's why I'm I, saying, I, just, I just don't I, do it. I completely agree. I completely agree with that. They they disagree. Those who who advocate Christian nationalism disagree, and they're trying to put they're trying to put language around it. I I, I reject the term uh, because everything that that I'm doing is all about the values that I hold dear, and I can do that and have done that with without it. I know these. I know many of these guys who advocate Christian nationalism. Before I even came on the segment, there was a couple of them I called and a few of them I texted and just said, hey, I want to make sure that, that, I'm ad that, I'm, that I'm representing your position correctly. Do you believe this? Do you believe that? So they affirmed those things, which are, which are some of the things that, that I shared uh, here. I, 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 at the end of the day, I would say that 80%, 70, 80% of the things that, that quote unquote Christian nationalists would go advocate for in the public square, for example, standing up uh, against uh, abortion, uh, standing in favor of, of a biblical worldview, standing up for children, all those things that Christian nationalists would stand for, I would stand right along with them uh, in the public square advocating those positions. 
I wouldn't care if someone called me a name, a, a Christian nationalist. I just do not, I, I reject that idea or ideology because I, someone else will end up utilizing that language, putting their own framework around, in, around it and, and trying to label me as such when the only thing that I'm going to be beholden to uh, is, is, is the scripture. What does scripture say? I don't need a label. I don't need, a, I don't need to be a nationalist of any kind. Uh, I can be a Christian. I can be a citizen. Uh, th that's, that's who I am. That's what I am without the label. So uh, I'm going to move on to Michael Moore. I'm going to say this last thing. Somebody years ago, hey, we're going to call these people and, and Kunta Kinte in the movie Roots, he just rejected that. Hey, my name's Kunta Kinte. Don't call me Toby. Don't call and, and that's the mentality we need. And, and, you know, I just, I can't say it any clearer than that. Someone wants to throw people, they're making a mistake letting a group that opposes Jesus Christ define them. And that, that's what is happening here. Oh, you're Christian nationalist. And you're like, okay, you're going to call me that. I'm going to take that name. Oh, you're going to call me. N okay, I'm going to call myself. N Insanity, in my view. I'm going to play. Uh, uh, Michael Moore uh, made some, <clears throat> the documentarian, Fahrenheit 9 11 and uh, Columbine, Bowling for Columbine, I think. Anyway, you guys know who Michael Moore is, hardcore leftist, friend of Bill Maher. Uh, he made an interesting uh, assertion uh, recently, I think on MSNBC or on one of these channels that I, I found fascinating. Again, this is where I go back to, and, and I think Michael Moore calls himself some sort of Catholic, uh, but he's not a very committed one in my view, but you know, that someone else can judge that. But I wanna hear, hear what you say, hear, hear you guys' thoughts as he describes uh, white Christian men as the enemy of Jews. What is the crime? Because according to my knowledge of history, um, uh, the enemies of Israel who have been persecuted, the Israelis, the, the, the Jewish people of this world have been persecuted for 5,000 years. But for the last 2,000 years, most of the persecution has come from white European-centric Christians. That's been your enemy. No Palestinian helped to build Auschwitz. No Palestinian stood on the docks of New York City when boatloads of Jewish refugee, refugees trying to escape the Holocaust came here to be protected by this country and were turned away at the docks in New York and sent back to Germany to die. No Palestinian did that. No Palestinian ran the Spanish Inquisition. Your enemy, your enemy is not the Palestinian people. It is white Christian European uh, uh, people who have been slaughtering Jews for the last 2,000 years. And let's just call it for what it is. But why are they in an open-air prison? Why are two million of them in an open-air prison? I don't know the is Israel-Palestine history well enough. And, and you know, he's, he's now going 2,000 years. I don't know if that's factually true. Uh, it, I want to wiser, more biblically sound people to tell me what to think about that. Anthony, get us rolling. Virgil, follow in. Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 6, verse number 12, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and against rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. As long as we are looking for an enemy in skin color, in an economic class, in a particular gender, whoever, as long as we find that, Satan has us right where he wants us. We'll be fighting each other for eons and eons. Oh, they've got, they're this, they're black, they're white, they're whatever. Evil is in Satan and right and just is in God. And that's the end of it. So as long as we're pointing at that, we'll never be where God wants us to be. Virgil, I, I mean, I, I, a hearty, hearty, hey man. I mean, that, there, there's, there's not, that, that's all. That's a mic drop at, at the end of the day because, uh, again, every time someone tries to pit us against one another based upon melanin, something that is static in our skin, your skin color 
it has nothing to do with the moral and ethical decisions that you make. You've made those decisions. You will be held accountable. And a group of people uh, that share that same level of melanin are not guilty as charged or are not innocent by any stretch of the imagination. All of us will be judged when we face God. Scripture says it this way. It is appointed unto man once to die and then thereafter the judgment, meaning that we all will give an account to God for our sins against him. So this idea that that we that we're charging people on the basis of levels of melanin in the skin is absolutely futile. And, and I, I I'll, I'll go even farther uh, and, and echo uh, you know what uh, what Anthony said earlier, which is you know this this it's, it's satanic. Satan has you in his in his grip. He has exactly where he wants you if that's what you're doing. Can and TJ, I don't know what response you want to give, but I, I would like. For someone, let's say we remove white out of it, and I'm asking sincerely. Let's just remove, he's saying Christians have been persecuting Jews for 2,000 years. Do we buy that? No, no. There, there's an attack on just Christianity. Obviously, we know that where that comes from, right? That comes from Satan. But sometimes it sneaks into the uh, on the atheist side, the atheist academic side, where they're saying, oh, well, the most evil we've seen done is from Christian folk. And that, that's been an argument which is, again, satanic in nature. Yeah, so I, the skin color thing, I'm obviously full agreement with both of you guys. The only thing I would add is just that, like, this, the ignorance you have to have to go on television and say that when the <laughs> preamble to the Hamas charter says Israel will exist and will continue to exist until Islam will obliterate it, just as it has obliterated others before it. Like, the Palestinian people elected Hamas. Forget their color. These, this is now a value and belief system. We can see they elected this group that says from the river to the sea and wants the eradication of the Jews. So to go on television and act like none of that is true is just insane. That's kind of where I was going in terms of, he added the word white to make it acceptable to a yes. certain group of people. Yes. And what he's really saying is Christians and that whole Christian religion is evil and wicked. And that's why they keep arguing that Christianity is the white man's religion, because they're trying to play a mental game with black people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Jesus Christ, he ain't for you. That's something the white man gave you. <laughs> and it's crazy. People yeah. are falling for it. Uh, I'll, if anybody's got a final thought, you can air it and or we can. Uh, wrap it up and play some harmony. Uh, Virgil, I'll give you the final thought. Give you an opportunity, Virgil, to uh, praise me the way you did, uh, Virgil. Perhaps we should end the show that way. Did, did I have any mic drop moments, uh, Virgil? Brother, you uh, yeah, every every play moment harmony, play moment. harmony. I don't want. I don't want. Don't want, don't want, don't want he, he's just Come gonna. On. He's just gonna tell me what I hear. He's gonna tell me. play <laughs> harmony. We're done. We'll see you tomorrow. up so divided stop fighting and stand tall we used to be a nation one united now we're headed for downfall god let your light shine down what we need more than anything Tell us.